Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at changinghighered.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Today, we welcome back a special guest, Mike Goldstein, Managing Director of the Center for Higher Education Transformation at Titan Partners. Mike is a pioneer in the development of the legal environment in higher education and a counselor at the highest levels of legislation. He founded the law firm Dow Loans in 1978, which merged into Cooley in 2014, and was a senior partner there for seven years before moving to Titan. Mike joins us today to talk about the most recent Dear Colleague letter from the Department of Education, this one referring to third-party servicer rules, and its implication on higher education institutions. And a hint, if you think that this doesn't affect you, you may be mistaken. Mike, welcome to the program, or should I say welcome back to the program? Well, thank you, Drum. It really is a pleasure to be on this program. I think you're one of the more articulate sources of really good information in the the higher education space. And it's always fun to have these conversations with you. Likewise, thank you very much. It's very kind of you to say. We we do certainly try and have interesting guests on such as yourself. And, you know, that makes it a lot of fun for me. But for those of you who haven't heard you on a podcast before, would you give an audience just a little bit of background on, on who you are? And I mean, I've always found your background fascinating. Well, I've been involved with higher education for um, about a half century, and I've been a university administrator. I was associate vice chancellor at the University of Illinois. I was the director of university relations for the city of New York. For many years, I had uh, higher education law practice at law firm Dalonis, and then uh, we merged into the global firm uh, Cooley in the uh, 20-teens. And then uh, more recently, I joined Titan Partners, which is a investment banking firm that is wrapped around a strategic consulting organization, but entirely devoted to the higher education vertical from pre-K through workforce development. And I've been working on what I think are some very innovative projects in the future of uh, American higher education. Well, you've been you've done this for many years, you know, not only working with accreditors, but your work with Cooley. I know we've crossed paths multiple times in our career, and I believe we have a lot of respect for each other's skills, and I really enjoy working with you. Well, that's certainly mutual, but you know, again, I think it's it's important that when we have these conversations that we're getting all sides of the issues. And I think that's, that's something that you're successful in doing. But there's always more to the story, as a well-known NPR program says. And I think this is one of those cases. Well, I, re- I remember Paul Harvey. And now you know the rest of the story. And that's hopefully what we're able to bring folks today. Well, I think we're, we're talking about a, something that has gotten a lot of notoriety in higher education. Now, that's obviously a very, very small segment of the population who actually cares about this. The issuance of what's called a Dear Colleague Letter, which is Department of Education speak for a document that expresses the opinion of the Secretary of Education regarding how a law or regulation is to be applied, is to be interpreted. So it's not law, it is I'm the secretary, and this is what I think the law or the regulation means. What is really happening here is a very, very complex information piece on the secretary's thought has been issued as a mechanism for achieving something quite independent of what a particular regulation was designed to do. So... The department has issued this Dear Colleague letter, which is guidance from the secretary. What is the problem they're trying to solve with this? Well, Jerome, that's that's a great question because we're spending a lot of time talking about what the Dear Colleague says, and I think we need to focus on why it came out in the first place. 
it is a very ingenious expansion of a very simple regulation that's designed to monitor companies that contract with institutions to provide services to manage federal student aid, various aspects of student aid. The department has found itself battered, I think that's the right word, uh, for many years over what is arguably its inability to manage what has become a fairly significant part of the higher education ecosystem, and that is companies and organizations that provide various kinds of services to institutions. And these services can be most notably the online program managers like 2U that take courses and convert them online and then provide the mechanism to distribute them and work with institutions in terms of recruiting and enrolling students to companies that deal with pathways for students coming from uh, foreign locations to companies that work on developing new curricula, uh, publishers, and uh, whether online or, or print, a wide variety of activities that institutions rely on to do their job better. And what the, the GAO and the Inspector General and various congressional oversight committees have said is you, Department of Education, don't really know what's going on in between these enterprises and the institutions. How much are they paying? How much control are they ceding over their operations as institutions? How much profit is being made by these organizations, if any? Who is running them? How well are they run? Who's responsible for their activities? One other point with that is at the root of all this is the use of Title IV in federal financial aid. Isn't that kind of the core of what they're trying to get at? Well, the Department of Education, when it comes to higher education, is really not involved with education. The Department of, of Education, okay. <laughs> with regard to higher ed, is basically a financing agency. It provides grants and loans to students. It's not involved with institutional quality. Under the law, that is the responsibility of accrediting agencies. Okay. It's not involved with the approval of institutions to grant degrees and other credentials. That's the responsibility of the states. So an institution has to be accredited. It has to be state authorized. And then the department says, okay, you now can participate in the student aid program. So the interest is in the money. Now, the money is in the many billions of dollars that flows from the federal treasury through the institutions to students, either as, as loans or as grants. So that's the hook. But the issue that the department's position is, we're responsible for ensuring that that money is used properly, and therefore we need to know how the institutions use it and how the students use it, and is that for the best public purpose? So that's, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that argument. The issue here is what they have done is grabbed hold of the third party service or regulation, which was intended for a purpose of entities that actually put their fingers on the federal money and said, we're going to use this as a way to answer the objections, the concerns that we've received from our overseers that we don't know enough about what's going on in higher education with regard to these non-institutional providers of support services to institutions. Mm -hmm. Well, that may, it makes sense that they would do that, but the mechanism you know, may not be the greatest thing. However, this is dumping an awful lot of stuff on TPS, making them do requirements. So what are those things that's dumping on them? And then let's talk about some of the responses that we've had from key people such as ACE and the U.S. Chamber. Well, the law is actually you know, pretty straightforward and that a third party servicer has to have a written agreement with the institution and the agreement has to have certain specifications, including details with regard to the financial arrangement between the institution and the third party servicer. The third party servicer is, the term is jointly and severally responsible. That's a legal term. What it really means is if there is liability for the improper use, and I don't want to use the word misuse, but the improper, which could be error as well as intentional misuse. If the third party servicer is involved with that, the third party servicer is liable with the institution 
for the re repayment of those funds. And the third party servicer must submit an annual audit that is in accordance with government accounting standards, which is considerably more complex than an audit, general audit. And finally, and this is it seems to be completely unrelated to the, the government's interest here. Uh, the third party servicer must be a U.S. company and must be controlled by uh, U.S. nationals. Now, that makes some sense with regard to entities that have their fingers on the federal money. The question here that has been a, a great puzzlement is what in the world does that have to do with someone who is, for example, providing support for online courses? And there's, there's actually a simple answer here. And it really goes to why did they choose third-party servicer as a vehicle for solving this problem that's been dumped on them by the Congress and their other oversight agencies? And the short answer is because it's there. Uh, the department has been quite ingenious in looking at its statutory and regulatory framework and identifying ways it can solve problems without necessarily going back to the Congress or without necessarily going to a complex regulatory process. And I, I want to come back to that in a moment. But what the department has done is say, look, we have this third-party servicer rule, and this third-party servicer gives us the oversight we're looking for. It lets us look at the contracts. It lets us look at the economic relationships. It binds the third-party servicers. It requires them to deliver detailed information about their, their finances. Why don't we just say that since the, the rule is drafted somewhat broadly, it says involving Title IV, which is the acronym for the, uh, the student aid programs, why don't we just expand it to cover all of these different providers? You know, it's just easy. It's a stroke of the pen, doesn't go through any kind of congressional review. It literally can't be challenged in the courts because all it's saying is what the secretary's opinion is. But it gets us exactly where we want because no institution is going to put itself in the line of fire. No one wants to be the first wildebeest to jump off the cliff knowing that the crocodiles are down below. Therefore, we accomplished what we want very simply. And they issued this Dear Colleague letter on uh, February 28th. They initially gave two weeks to comment on it. There was an uproar over that, so they extended it to yesterday. They also moved back the implementation date from May 1st to September 30th, I believe. I have to double check the number on that to give more room. They also did something else that was, I would say, curious. Almost simultaneously, they published an announcement saying that we are going to do what's called a negotiated rulemaking. We are going to have a comprehensive, very intensive, very time-consuming process to review a whole suite of regulations, including those regulations that involve the oversight of entities providing services to institutions. And we're going to initiate that over the next several months, really beginning in the uh, late spring, going for the next six to eight months. Now, that will result in new regulations. That will be a process that will have weeks of hearings, a long period of public comment, a requirement that the Department of Education review and respond to those public comments a requirement that it publish draft regulations that then will be subject to further comment, and then final regulations, which will likely not go into effect until at the earliest possible, July 1st of 2024, and more likely because of what's called the standard calendar, July 1st of 2025. So that is a process that very carefully and very intensely goes through a review by all the affected parties. And the department then comes out, not necessarily with regulations that people like, but at least regulations that people can say, okay, we understand what they've done, why they've done it, because they will be explaining in great detail what they've done, why they've done it. And if we're lucky, it will be by consensus. 
And if we're not lucky, at least we will know what they're doing. We've seen Negreg before. We saw one in 2019, which had all of the issues come up for consensus. But one of the things with Negreg is if it comes out within X number of months prior to a change of administration, all those rules can be set aside. Am I right? Not easily. Okay. Uh, and that's, that, that's an important point. If the rules have not been promulgated, then a process can be stopped. But once a rule is promulgated, one has to go through a new proceeding to set the rules aside. I mean, we can see here that with the, the, the Biden administration, there are numbers of rules in the environmental area and other areas where they are in the process of changing a rule or suspending a rule. But it, there is a formal process. Now, again, the, the advantage and the curse of a dear colleague is it is a statement of opinion. Mm -hmm. And it can be rescinded the day after it's issued, and it can be rescinded by the next administration. And we have seen administration to administration changes in interpretation of dear colleagues that in some cases have been 180 degree reversals. So mm -hmm. one of the reasons I would, would think that they are trying to do the regulatory proceeding is that in the short term, and certainly until the, the next administration, if there is a change, they have effectively changed the rules. And by the time there is a next administration, if they have promulgated a, a rule, even though it has not necessarily gone into effect, they've triggered a process that cannot very easily been reversed. It can be reversed, mm -hmm. but it, it becomes more difficult. So they've solved, they think, in the near term, a problem. And then they're also setting in place a process to solve, they think, the process in the long term. What's interesting is that with minor exception, every organization involved in higher education from the American Council on Education, which is the umbrella for all post-secondary institutions, to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which traditionally has been very supportive of the for-profit side of higher education, have come out with almost identical letters arguing that the, the dear colleague is wrong, it is overbroad, it is over-restrictive. There is unanimity, for example, that the foreign ownership, foreign control restriction is absurd and highly detrimental to higher education institutions. There is unanimity that the burden imposed on institutions is far greater than necessary. There is unanimity that the burden that is imposed on third-party servicers will have a dramatic effect on restricting the, avail the availability of services and increasing the cost of services to institutions, which is quite remarkable because usually there's this polar split of the traditional institutions coming out on one side and the, the for-profit on the other side and the support organizations of them. There are a few who have been arguing for the transparency issue for years, who view this as finally doing what is needed. It is not surprising that federal student aid, which is led by Mr. Cordray, who was previously the head of the Consumer Finance Protection Board and a quite brilliant consumer advocate, is the, the vehicle that has, has put this, this out because it does speak very strongly on a consumer advocacy perspective, but the balance between the information needed to protect the consumer and the effect of how that institution is gathered is so out of balance and the impact it has on higher education that everybody has kind of jumped back in their, their seat and saying, wait, wait, we understand the issue. We don't understand the cure. Mm -hmm. Well, all this makes a lot of sense. I wonder though, for those folks who use third-party servicers, obviously this is going to be a major impact. For those who don't, is this going to impact them at all? Well, the short answer is there probably aren't any who don't. Okay. Because the it's not just OPMs. It's not just those who provide uh, online services. It is, it's, it's publishers. It's, um, it's test publishers. It's 
organizations that provide student evaluative information, that provide student support services, that provide counseling services. It, almost everything that is done short of janitorial services will fall under, under these rules or, or may fall under the rules. So part of the problem is not, well, you know, there's only a, hand, you know, a relative handful of schools that use OPMs. And the answer is actually that's not so. It's very substantial now. But there's actually a relative handful of schools that will not in some way be affected administratively in terms of what they have to do. And a quite wide panoply of organizations that serve higher education that have nothing to do with, for example, online courseware. So if part of this is we've got to get a handle on the OPMs, what they've done is they've said, well, we've, we've got this three-inch target. We're going to fire a bazooka at it. And you know, we'll, we'll probably hit the target. And by the way, you know, we're going to get rid of the rest of the room. That's a piece of the issue. It, it's the, the extraordinary breadth of, of what has been included within the scope of this, uh, of this dear colleague. So just as an example, the expansion that I've heard with it would include companies who provide learning management software, LMS. It could be expanded to them. Am I right? Yes, absolutely. And so if you have online programs that you're only using an LMS that you have not created yourself, if you're running one from Canvas or Moodle or, or something like that, you're subject to this letter. But, but remember that 90 some odd percent of institutions now use online as part of their instructional model. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of them use it on campus. They either don't enroll online students remotely or they have a very small number. When my son was in college, quite some years ago, he was at a large public university, residential, far from home. And by his senior year, he was taking about a third of his courses online. He would have a class once a week, a seminar, and then the rest of the program would be delivered to his laptop in the dormitory, or in, in this case, in the senior year, in his apartment. That's an LMS. That's covered. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. has nothing to do with worrying about the, you know, the, the, the predatory online institutions. This is core to how institutions carry out their educational purpose, doing it better. There's absolutely no question that in many respects, delivering a course, certainly in a hybrid manner, is more effective than delivering a course face-to-face. -face. Very few institutions have wet labs for chemistry any longer. They, they do it online because you can't be blinded by a beaker blowing up if it's on the screen of your, of your laptop. You sure can in a lab. Mm -hmm. Again, this sweeps that in. Wow. Well, this, this is far, far reaching, a lot more so than I think most people understood. Well, I think part of the problem is... What the department was trying to do was make it as inclusive as possible so that it would be difficult to, to evade the requirement. So we just say, look, if you're, you're providing a service that touches students in, in terms of their educational program, and that's essentially what they've said, then you're covered. Arguably, they're doing so because their experience is if you write something more narrowly, people are going to find a way to step around it. They don't want that to happen. But obviously, as you make it more inclusive, you are then sweeping things in that nobody's asking you any information about. Now, maybe that's not, that's not true. I think that there's interest in you know how much do institutions pay for LMS? How much do institutions pay for outsource student counseling services or outsource various forms of assisting in student retention, for example, which there are many companies now who work with, in, with institutions to reduce dropout and to support students in terms of continuing their programs. So there certainly have been questions raised of, you know, how, what, what is that industry all about? It's not arguably illegitimate to ask the question. The question is whether 
by sweeping in this mechanism, which is quite extraordinarily burdensome, and organizations have, are very careful not to inadvertently become third-party services for precisely that reason. The whole industry of, of providing Title IV support services is a very small industry that has you know, a relative handful of players precisely because the burden of doing it is so relatively high and it is so highly technical. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I'm just, you don't find me speechless very often, Mike, but on this one, I, I really am. I can see the reasons why, why the department is doing this, but at the same time, it's just going to impact institutions so much until they're actually able to do this. You see, I, I think I, I want to challenge something there because it's not, it's not a time function. Okay. I think it actually will prevent institutions and it will prevent those entities that work with institutions from actually being able to work together. I mean, for example, the foreign exclusion. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some very, very fine companies that are in you know, such questionable places like Canada that would, would be excluded from pr providing services to institutions under this rule. Now, I think the foreign exclusion, by the way, is an accident. It, it has been part of the third-party service of rules from the beginning. And the reason is, if federal money is being managed in some respect by an entity, that entity should be located in the U.S. so it is subject to American law. That is not irrational. Mm -hmm. In order to bring someone under the third-party service of rules, the, the disclosure rules, what the department is looking at is, we want to know what these folks are doing. They have to they declare them a third party servicer. If you are declared a third party servicer, you must be a domestic company. So it's not we're looking to exclude foreign companies. It was an attribute of using third party servicer regulation to capture the information. And oh, by the way, because of that, you have to be an American company. Mm. And the department has put themselves in a real box. Because you can't say by guideline, we're going to cover you by the rule, but by the way, you're not subject to the regulatory requirement. You, you can't be partially pregnant with regard to being a third-party servicer. The department does not have that authority. So if they take that away, at least I would argue that, they have then essentially vitiated the ability to bring them under the rule because you can't, I don't think, isolate the rule in that way. So, so that's, that's a piece that I think may, in fact, be the Achilles heel of what the department has done, because there is uniform pushback on the, uh, the foreign ownership rule. Now, whether there's a workaround, you know, how that's worked out, I don't know. But I, I think the department has got, it got itself in a really difficult position there. And short of saying we're going to change the foreign ownership rule to require a whole different set of reporting requirements that, that are not onerous and therefore you can be a foreign owner. That may be what actually deep six is what the department is doing right now. Mm -hmm. One last question before we wrap up. Does the department have the bandwidth to be able to administer this? Uh, let's see. The long answer and the short answer is no. Uh, and I'll give you a very simple example. The, the, Department a few weeks ago sent out a notification to institutions that it was going to do secret shopping. Mm -hmm. And it was going to have Department of Education investigators, um, you know, go on the web and uh, inquire of institutions and see, see what their marketing practices are. And this was going to be managed through the department's enforcement arm. That is a tiny organization. Now, however, it accomplishes exactly what the department wants because it is saying to everyone, we're not going to be listening to everything, but you don't know whether we're listening. Mm -hmm. So you better be good. Is the department going to be able to review every document? They're not going to be able to review more than a tiny number, but they're telling institutions, we want you to have all of that. Are they going to review the audits? of every third-party servicer? No, but they're going to have them. 
because these are, have to be submitted to the department so that when they want to look, where they want to look, they will have the opportunity to do so. So do they have the bandwidth to, to review everything? No. Does everybody get audited by the IRS? No. Is everybody have in the back of their minds, we may be? Yes. So it succeeds. If the IRS tomorrow says, oh, by the way, we are never going to audit anybody's tax return ever again, I would suspect tax compliance would drop by a very measurable number. I, I suspect you're, you're right on that. Well, Mike, this has been fascinating. Thank you. Three takeaways for university presidents and boards. Uh, number one, don't panic. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> uh, this is a very much a work in progress. Uh, there is sufficient pushback by very highly respected entities across the spectrum that I think this will definitely undergo at least significant revision, if not rescinded and uh, await a rulemaking, number one. Number two, I think there is not an increased reason to be um, mindful of the agreements that one ent enters into, but institutions should always be mindful of the agreements they enter into, and the entities entering into the agreements need to be mindful of writing their agreements carefully and uh, being sure that if it does come into the public view, there's nothing there that's going to result in an OMG moment. Mm -hmm. The third is that higher education is evolving. And one thing that, that I would, would argue is that while the pandemic effect on K-12 education has been devastatingly bad, its effect on higher education has been to accelerate the use of delivery technologies that probably we've moved the needle maybe five, maybe 10 years. That's a good thing. I think we're doing a better job. I think we're reaching more students better. And we need to be careful that in the service of making it perfect, we're not impeding the ability to serve the student. Thank you. Those are great takeaways. Great takeaways. Mike, what's next for you? What, what's exciting you these days? Well, aside from dealing with panic over third-party services, I'm on a panel at the right. ASU GSV uh, Ed tech conference next month in uh, in San Diego uh, with 5,000 of my closest friends. This is a topic that we're going to be talking about that everyone is concerned with. But what I'm really, what I'm doing and what I'm really excited about is the kinds of innovative things that institutions are coming up with, the new kinds of inter-institutional relationships, of institutions gathering together in systems to be more efficient and more effective and to provide a uh, better suite of services to a broader range of students, the ability of specialized institutions to be able just to configure themselves in different ways, whether it's domestically or internationally, whether it's collaborating with other institutions, whether it's collaborating with other kinds of entities, with employers, with service providers, with community-based organizations. I mean, the notion of the campus on a hill, I, I think, is an, is an anachronism. And the notion of higher education institutions as being, you know, far more broad based and operating across domains is really what the future holds. And that's what's exciting. I think so as well. Mike, it's been a pleasure having you on the show again. I look forward to our continued association and having you back. Drum, I certainly look forward to that. Thanks for listening today. And a special thank you to Mike Goldstein of Titan Partners and for his sharing his views on the recent Dear Colleague letter regarding third-party services and its potential implication on all higher education institutions. Tune in next week for our 150th episode with our guest, Amrit Aluwalia, Senior Director of Strategic Insights at Modern Campus and Editor-in-Chief of The Evolution, an online newspaper developed by Modern Campus focused on non-traditional higher education in the transforming post-secondary marketplace. Until next week. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. 
find more information about this topic along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show and we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White.